Now in our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1158 of This Week in Amateur Radio. An amateur radio firefighter rescues a person drowning in a local river. We will have the details. The United States is investigating possible mysterious directed energy attacks occurring near the White House. The return of four astronauts from the space station makes the first nighttime splashdown since 1968. First-time FCC applicants must obtain a Federal Registration Number, or FRN, before taking exams. The former home of the Dayton Hamvention, the Hera Arena, is now just a pile of rubble. Europe's largest amateur radio convention is canceled once again this year due to the never-ending pandemic. The Wireless Institute of Australia is asking for more spectrum for amateurs in the HF bands in that country. And a radio club in the United Kingdom finds it gets real great performance from using fences as radio antennas. We will have all the details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will discuss how to repurpose that old computer in your closet with free open source software. And he will discuss what we all do with our fondle slabs. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLEB, will discuss ergonomics in your shack. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill looks at what amateur radio was like during the post-World War II years. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will answer the question, what should I bring with me up the tower? That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting this week from our news bureau and studios of the Museum of Science and Technology in downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine. KB2FAF. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where it's springtime and the birds all do sing, announcing what nature will bring. New eggs in a nest, a La Robin's love fest, and the bunnies just having a fling. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from a chilly Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our News Bureau just outside Albany, New York, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the weather has been running hot and cold. You don't like the weather? Just wait a minute. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here's Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off this week's news, ARRL member and Edmondson County Emergency Coordinator Tim Skees, K9KSP, a firefighter in Brownsville, Kentucky, was among those responding to an April 23rd fire dispatch call he heard on his ham station scanner reporting a possible drowning in the Green River. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more. Radio traffic indicated that the potential victim was a 40-year-old man. Skies told ARRL that after assessing the information provided by family members at the scene, he went down river approximately 300 yards, located the victim in the water, washed up on a shallow rock shoal in the river. He waded out to the victim, dragged him to the riverbank, and as other responders showed up and came to where the victim was, he was pulled up the bank of the river. The man was suffering exposure and hypothermia from being in the cold water for hours, and he was later transported to the hospital. Ski says the incident stands as a testament to the need for hams to get involved with the emergency services and foster good working relationships with emergency managers and local agencies. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. 
Skies said the man's family had at first called in the incident as a confirmed drowning. The man was first taken to the vehicle of Edmondson County Emergency Management Director Terry Macy and warmed up until an ambulance could arrive. Macy told local media that the local dispatcher paged the Brownsville Fire Department around 2 a.m. after a caller had reported a possible drowning at the Brownsville boat ramp. Macy said he and Skies arrived at the area and saw two unoccupied vehicles. In just a minute, we could hear some yelling down at the river and could tell it was downstream a good ways, he told the Edmondson Voice. Macy said he and Skies followed the commotion and found the man in about a foot of water, lying on his side, and Skies waited in to retrieve him. Macy said that according to others on the scene, the man had fallen into the water while trying to retrieve some fishing gear. Federal agencies are investigating at least two possible incidents on U.S. soil, including one near the White House in November of last year, that appear similar to mysterious invisible attacks that have led to debilitating symptoms for dozens of U.S. personnel abroad. Multiple sources familiar with the matter tell CNN that while the Pentagon and other agencies probing the matter have reached no clear conclusions on what happened, the fact that such an attack might have taken place so close to the White House is particularly alarming. Defense officials briefed lawmakers on the Senate and House Armed Services Committees on the matter earlier this month, including on the incident near the White House. That incident, which occurred near the Ellipse, the large oval lawn on the south side of the White House, sickened one National Security Council official, according to multiple current and former U.S. officials and sources familiar with the matter. In a separate 2019 episode, a White House official reported a similar attack while walking her dog in a Virginia suburb just outside Washington, GQ reported last year. Those sickened reported similar symptoms to CIA and State Department personnel impacted overseas, and officials quickly began to investigate the incident as a possible Havana Syndrome attack. That name refers to unexplained symptoms that U.S. personnel in Cuba began experiencing in late 2016, a varying set of complaints that includes ear popping, vertigo, pounding headaches, and nausea, sometimes accompanied by unidentified piercing directional noise. Rumors have long swirled around Washington about similar incidents within the United States. While the recent episodes around Washington appear similar to the previous apparent attacks affecting diplomats, CIA officers and other U.S. personnel serving in Cuba, Russia, and China, investigators have not determined whether the puzzling incidents at home are connected to those that have occurred abroad or who may be behind them, sources tell CNN. Radio amateurs everywhere are being encouraged to engage with the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 National Member Societies on the early stages of a workshop program about the future of amateur radio. At the workshop later this year, Region 1 Member Societies will be asked to formulate their views on the future direction for amateur radio and the programs needed to ensure it develops successfully. As a first step, work is already underway to develop an understanding of the current state of amateur radio in each country. The input of the amateur community is vital for the success of the workshop. In preparation, the Radio Society of Great Britain is conducting a short survey of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats that apply to amateur radio in the UK. The Society would like to hear the views of all UK radio amateurs as well as those who are not licensed. For more information and a link to the survey, see the RSGB website at www.rsgb.org forward slash survey. And the deadline for responses is the 23rd of May. The International Space Station X-Crew mission with astronauts Michael Hopkins, KF5LJG, Victor Glover, KI5BKC, Shannon Walker, KD5DXP, and Soichi Noguchi, KD5TVP, splashed down safely in the Gulf of Mexico on May 2nd. With war and their historic splashdown, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. It marked NASA's first nighttime splashdown since 1968, the first ever from the ISS. 
and the first operational mission for SpaceX. Launched last November to carry the crew to the ISS, the Crew Dragon spacecraft Resilience returned the crew to Earth. Crew 1 is the first of six crewed missions, NASA said. Upon their arrival back on Earth, SpaceX Mission Control official Michael Hyman greeted the astronauts with this quip. Dragon, on behalf of NASA and the SpaceX teams, we welcome you back to planet Earth and thanks for flying SpaceX. For those of you enrolled in our frequent flyer program, you have earned 68 million miles on this voyage. And SpaceX, resilience, it is back on planet Earth and we'll take those miles. Are they transferable? And Dragon will have to refer you to our marketing department for that policy. SpaceX will fly as part of the agency's commercial crew program, which worked with the U.S. aerospace industry to return rockets, spacecraft, and launches with astronauts to the U.S. In advance of departure from the space station, Crew-1 astronaut and station commander Walker handed over the command of the station to astronaut and Crew-2 member Ahiko Hoshidi last week during a change of command and farewell event. The Crew Dragon undocked and departed the space station autonomously. In addition to the crew, resilience will also have to return important and time-sensitive material to Earth. While in space, some of the returning astronauts hosted amateur radio on the International Space Station, contacting schools. ARRL is an ARISS sponsor. Hara Arena originated as a ballroom in 1956. Dayton Hamvention began using Hanna Arena in 1964 when the main 5500-seat arena was built. Six buildings were added later. Over the years, Hanna Arena was home to sports teams, concerts, conventions, and social activities. It closed in August 2016 due to ongoing financial issues and a 20-year-long legal fight over the unresolved estate of founder Harold Rampler. Eventually, a new owner was found. In May 2019, Hera was severely damaged by a tornado and considered not worth rebuilding. The building's iconic logo, as well as bricks from the structure, were to be auctioned for charity. The site has since been cleared for redevelopment, and only piles of rubble remain of the original Hera Arena facility. New advances in HF radio and digital signal processing technology for terrestrially based long range communications offers a renewed cost effective alternative to satellite communications in military applications. Ron Broden, Whiskey 9 Tango November Golf, was interviewed in a recent Collins Aerospace article. Dead spots of communications on the modern battlefield are a nightmare for the warfighter, whether on the ground or in the air. In a global scenario, communications need to be reliable, survivable and resilient. In many cases, the modernization of communications relies heavily on satellite solutions, and high-frequency radio, which had been used since the 1930s, had taken a back seat. But HF radios are making a comeback, HF filling a growing need by eliminating dead zones. Advanced long-distance communications are critical. While satellite communications have been relied upon across the battlefield, there are many vulnerabilities that remain a concern for military leaders. These include malicious attacks, overtaxing of the systems, and solar mass ejections, all a looming threat of denial of service. This is where experts see HF radio making a comeback. In fact, in some remote parts of the world where countries don't have their own satellite constellation or in the jungle like the Amazon and across oceans, HF has always been the long distance mode of communications because satellite coverage isn't available or wouldn't work well. Think about that high tree canopy or tropical storms as an additional challenge to satellite communications. And military naval communications, for example, are nearly always beyond line of sight and need a reliable communications link for command and control. Gyro Soterio, Business Development Director for the Americas at Collins Aerospace, said that satellite pipes are just not large enough to handle the communications needs of everyday civilian and military applications, especially during times of disaster. He said that at these times, HF is an established beyond a line of sight capability and provides an effective way to communicate, and the new technologies are making it easier to operate and with higher throughput and resilience than ever before. 
Ron, Whiskey 9 Tango November Golf, said in the interview that today there is much more demand to transfer large amounts of data, especially for beyond line of sight communications, and it's taxing on a communication system. New HF technologies enable higher speed data transfer with data driven applications. The United States Air Force is already upgrading aircraft with new HF radios for the primary mission of reconnaissance. The ability to securely transfer command and control data in real time over HF radio for clear voice communications is imperative. The move from analog voice to digital voice has been one of the biggest advantages of HF over the past few years, said Ron. Think about it like an AM radio station versus an FM radio station. The difference in clarity is dramatic. You can read a lot more about how HF data systems have been developing in the article. Just go to modernbattlespace.com and search for HF radios make a comeback. International Amateur Radio Union asks, what do you think is the future of amateur radio? Radio amateurs everywhere are encouraged to engage with IARU Region 1 National Member Societies on the early stages of the Region 1 workshop program about the future of amateur radio. At the workshop later this year, Region 1 member societies will be asked to formulate their views on future direction of amateur radio and the programs needed to ensure it develops successfully. As a first step, work is already underway to develop an understanding of the current state of amateur radio in each country. The input of the amateur community is vital for the success of the workshop. Participate in the RSGB survey at https colon forward slash forward slash www dot rsgb dot org forward slash survey and you can watch the short video what do you think about the future of amateur radio with Raisa Skrinikova R1BIG on YouTube Hello, I am Raisa R1BIG just upgraded for a full license I will take part in the IARU Region 1 workshop on the future of amateur radio our modern and fascinating hobby is not only for men. I will share my ideas to help us growing. Do you want to help us too? Please contact your national society. An article on the Tennessean website describes how a husband and wife briefly escaped from a secure memory unit at an assisted living facility in Lebanon, Tennessee last month by using military experience with Morse to decipher and memorize the code to an electronic door lock, according to Tennessee Department of Health documents obtained through a public records request. The couple, who have dementia and Alzheimer's disease, went missing from the home for about 30 minutes last March before a stranger found them walking down a road two blocks from the facility. Once safely back at the home, staff were curious about how the couple had escaped from the facility's memory unit, which is secured by a locked door with an electronic keypad. The man said he'd previously worked with Morse code in the military and was able to use this experience to learn the door code by listening as staff punched numbers into the keypad. As a result of the escape, Elmcroft Care Home of Lebanon was fined $2,000 by state officials. The assisted living facility told state regulators it will prevent similar incidents by checking on residents more frequently and scheduling the man who escaped for walking time outside the facility with a staff member present. The home has also changed all its exit codes, according to a statement provided by the company. If you want to find out more, navigate to the health section of eu.tennessean.com. And our thanks to Andy, G0 Sierra Foxtrot Juliet, for this story. The Wireless Institute of Australia's Spectrum Strategy Committee has called for more amateur radio spectrum in the 3 to 12 megahertz range. The committee raised the issue in its response to regulatory ACMA's five-year Spectrum Outlook 2021. With more on what the WIA has on its wish list, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME at League Headquarters. The WIA committee said global demand for HF amateur spectrum has grown, particularly since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, and congestion, particularly on 40 meters from both legitimate and unauthorized transmissions, is often severe during times of increased ionospheric propagation. 
The committee pointed out that heightened global tensions have increased the use of high-power HF radars over the horizon radars that frequently disrupt HF amateur communications across large segments of spectrum. The WIA, Australia's IARU member society, intends to seek expansions to amateur bands in the 3 to 12 megahertz segment over the next five years, at least for Australian amateurs, in alignment with international allocations, although the WIA acknowledges that this is a lower priority than other items it has proposed. The 3 to 12 megahertz spectrum is already home to four amateur allocations, 80 and 75 meters, 60 meters, 40 meters, and 30 meters. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The WIA is pressing for increased amateur access to the spectrum in the range between 3 and 10 megahertz, saying the expansion will enhance what it calls frequency agility. That's an option the WIA says amateurs need as they battle congestion, high-power RF radar systems, and overwhelming interference. The WIA is also advocating study of the bands between 2300 to 2302 MHz and 3300 to 4200 MHz. Beginning May 20, 2021, all amateur examination applicants will be required to provide an FCC registration number, or FRN, to the volunteer examiners before taking an amateur exam. This is necessary due to changes the FCC has made to its licensing system. Amateur candidates who already have an FCC license, whether for amateur radio or in another service, already have an FRN and can use the same number. All prospective new FCC licensees, however, will be required to obtain an FRN before the examination and provide that number to the volunteer examiners on the Form 605 license application. An FCC instructional video provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to obtain an FRN through the FCC's Commission Registration System. The FRN is required for all new applicants to take an amateur exam and is used afterward by the applicant to download the license document from the FCC Universal Licensing System, upgrade the license, apply for a vanity call sign, and to submit administrative updates such as address and email changes and renewal applications. In addition, after June 29th, all applications will be required to contain an email address for FCC correspondence. Applicants will receive an email direct from the FCC with a link to the official electronic copy of their license whenever a license is issued or changed. ARRLVEC suggests that those without access to email to use the email address of a family member or friend. Licensees will be able to log into the ULS using their FRN and password to download the latest version of their license at any time. The FCC no longer provides paper license documents. The annual Ham Radio Show in Friedrichshafen, Germany will once again be held virtually. The June event is sponsored by the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club in cooperation with the Friedrichshafen Fair, Messe Friedrichshafen. Under the current circumstances, ham radio can no longer take place in June as planned, said Messe Friedrichshafen CEO Klaus Wellmann. He said to remedy the situation and send a clear signal of resilience, the virtual ham radio world will take place from June 25th until June 27th, the original show dates. Admission and participation will be free. The annual ham radio gathering, known popularly as simply Friedrichshafen, typically draws between 15 and 17,000 visitors from all over Europe and around the world. ARRL has traditionally sent a contingent to staff a booth at the ham radio event every summer. This is the second virtual presentation of ham radio due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, Ham Radio World will offer a completely new virtual world in 2D, and its unique live character will be impressive, DARC said. The CEO of Messe Friedrichshafen, Klaus Wellmann, called this event a digital version of Europe's leading amateur radio trade show. The three-day replacement event is free and is being coordinated with the DARC to schedule a variety of ham radio topics presented on the virtual stage and a showcase of cutting-edge products. 
Simulating an in-person environment as much as possible on the platform, the event will feature opportunities for video chat and customizable avatars representing visitors. DARC Chairman Christian Enstfellner, DL3MBG, said the live character of the event's virtual environment will be recreated in great detail, opening up new possibilities and offering plenty of space for community networking and virtual meetings, in addition to an online lecture program and commercial offerings. To allow participants a more personal experience, Individual hams represented as customizable avatars will move around the virtual exhibition grounds and video chat with each other, explained Friedrich Schaven project manager Petra Rathgeber. Friedrich Schaven and the DERC are working closely together to ensure that a diverse lineup of ham radio products, trends, and innovations will await our visitors at the three-day digital event. Ham Radio World will offer presentations and discussions on ham radio topics, as well as a program presented on DARC's virtual stage. Further details will be forthcoming. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., Virtual Contest University and the 2021 Virtual Hamvention Forums are accepting registration for sessions being held live through Zoom. Separate registration is required for each event. Visit ContestUniversity.com and Hamvention.org for more details or to register. The regulator in the Falkland Islands has set a deadline for non-residents seeking revalidation of their VPA call signs. Hams holding a non-resident lifetime license in the Falkland Islands, a VP8 call sign, need to have those call signs revalidated by the Falkland Islands Communications Regulator. In making the announcement on the 27th of April, the regulator said the revalidation is open to hams who previously held such a license. This is the third and final opportunity hams will have at revalidation, and any license not properly revalidated will be considered terminated as of the 1st of September. The regulator has set a deadline of August 13th for all applications. The form is available as a download from the regulator's website. The Radio Society of Great Britain's Examination and Syllabus Review Group has just updated the two full license mock exam papers. In addition, there are now worked answer PDFs for these papers, so you can see the correct answer for each question and the reasoning behind it. These mock papers are provided by the ESRG as a training aid and aren't the exact questions included in a full license exam. Foundation and intermediate mock exam papers will have worked answers added in due course. You can find all the mock exam papers on the Society's website, rsgb.org forward slash mock hyphen exams. And 2020 was a year like no other for everyone around the world. In the UK, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Radio Amateurs rose to the challenge. The Society has launched a new video that looks back at the many fantastic activities and resources that helped support Radio Amateurs through these difficult times. It also shows how existing radio amateurs got on the air to care across the UK and thousands of people of all ages got involved in amateur radio for the first time. You can take a look at the RSGB's YouTube channel www.youtube.com forward slash the RSGB. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. I don't know what you do with those old computers. You know, uh, you can donate them. There are charities uh, like, uh, what was it, the Christina Foundation that will take old computers, recondition them. Uh, usually they'll, you know, wipe the drive, put Linux or something free on there and uh, give it to uh, charitable organizations that need computing power. You know, computers... Uh, they, especially, you know, the computer you're buying today with no moving parts, you know, the hard drives will wear out. But the, with nowadays with SSDs, they're not going to wear out for a lot longer than the software will be useful for. This is the problem. You know, uh, the computers we got, the computers we're buying today, they are very, very powerful. They'll go for a good 10, 15 years without becoming obsolete. But the software gets obsolete, right? So I love the idea of reconditioning, bringing back an old computer to life by putting a modern operating system on it. And I'm not talking Windows and I'm not talking Mac. I'm talking an open source, free operating system like Linux. The reason is, uh, and Ubuntu is, is, a, is the easiest one to use, especially if you're coming from Windows, it'll be very, very familiar. There, there are, by the way, hundreds of flavors of Linux. 
and for all different kinds of users. You know, there's very geeky Linuxes, and there's Linux for novice. Ubuntu is a great kind of choice for anybody who's not used it before. Very easy to use. You install software from a store, just like as you would with Windows or Mac. With a click of the mouse, it's very straightforward. I think, frankly, the, com the days of uh, proprietary commercial software are fading. Believe it or not, maybe for specialized stuff like video editing or photo editing, but for the most part, how are you going to make a word processor better? And the free and open source version of Office, for instance, is as good as Office. How are you going to make Office better? How is Microsoft going to justify that 10 or 15 bucks a month they're charging for Office 365? It's not going to get that much better. It's been done everything you need to do for years, hasn't it? Hasn't it? I mean, what, <laughs> what feature is missing? So it, it, uh, open source software has really kind of caught up, in other words. It's kind of what they're, and admittedly, they're building on the foundation that the co private companies like Microsoft and Apple have created, copying in many cases what Microsoft Office can do. But at this point, there's a lot to be said, and, and you don't have to, for you, by using free open source software. Not only free as in it costs nothing, more importantly, free as in, liberty as in free as in no commercial entity can spy on you no government can spy on you uh it's your it's yours you own it and as companies like microsoft and apple and google and facebook and more and more in the mindset that we own you you we don't work for you you work for us you're the product we're you know then really that's how they're thinking isn't it when microsoft puts a big blue window up on your desktop saying, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but you really ought to upgrade to Windows 10, covering everything you're doing, covering the everything you're doing, forcing you, even if you're in the middle of something really important, to pay attention to their ad, that's the time to turn your back on them, I, I say. And, and uh, start using software that works for you, not software you, that em employs you. <laughs> I just think that's wrong. So go, by all means, if you haven't used it before, go try it. It's easy to try uh, Ubuntu. You go to ubuntu.com, uh, download it. You can put it on a USB stick or a CD or a DVD. You can actually try before you buy it. You don't have to install it. You just boot to that USB stick or you boot to the CD. Start up your computer by booting not to your internal hard drive but to that external device, and you'll be able to use it completely. I mean, it's a little slow because it's running off a USB stick, but it's there, and you can see how it works. You can see if you like it. You can try a lot of different versions of Linux that way. Pick one you like. If you're a Mac user and you want something that feels and looks like Mac, there's Elementary OS that is designed to be a Macish Linux experience. Free, open source, free as in money, but but more importantly, free as in liberty. And I think that's that's where computing is going, to be honest. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? It's so hard sometimes to remember how things used to be. We're like a fish in the water. We don't really we're not, we're surrounded by it, but we don't really we're not really aware of the water. We're not we're we're not well equipped to notice how things have changed. Occasionally, you know, old timers like me will say, "I remember when you had to go into the bank to get money. You had to go in the door, and there were people inside." I remember. <laughs> When you had a little machine hooked up to your telephone line and it had a paper, a little crinkly up paper, it would spit out documents. I remember when you had to call people to talk to them. And now we just, you know, well, I'll tell you what, when's the last time you made a phone call? I know a lot of us still make phone calls, but I think that's starting to die out too, right? We don't, we don't even think about the phone aspect of a smartphone as much as we're now talking about the camera. Camera's number one, right? The screen, the games you can play. Well, that's another thing that's changed. We cannot stand. I notice this now with myself and with everybody around me. We cannot stand to sit idle for even one second. You're in an elevator, you pull out your phone. You're in a grocery line, you pull out your phone. People don't just look around anymore or talk to each other. They, they, they pull out their... Their little amusement device. The register calls uh, smartphones fondle slabs. 
the Register's a British uh, tech publication. They have the kind of British attitudes towards all this. But the idea is it's a slab of glass. They're all basically the same, right? That you fondle. I was noticing the other day. So I'm I'm standing there and I and I what was I doing? I can't remember. Oh, I was I know what I was. I was on a uh, on a light rail train on the way to the football game, to the 49ers game, and it's a crowded train. And it's a, you know, 20 minute trip uh, on the light rail. And I'm looking around, a lot of young people all have their phone out, and I'm kind of being a, my stubborn old man guy. I didn't pull my phone out. I'm not going to look at it. I'm going to look around. I'm going to talk to people. Nobody wants to talk to you. They're looking at their phone. Okay, I'm not going to talk to people. I'm just going to look around. Man, it's boring in here. <laughs> but then I pulled out my phone. I did. I, 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 I could do it about three minutes. <laughs> and, then I, and then I pulled out my phone. And there, it's not like there's compelling content on there. I almost, I look at it and I go, well, I did. Oh, I already looked at Instagram. I guess I could look at my Facebook feed. Nothing new there. Anything going on on Twitter? Well, there's always something new there, but none of it makes any sense. <laughs> so you're kind of still staring off into space, aren't you? You have different stimuli, but it's not like you're learning something. <laughs> or maybe you are. Maybe maybe you're. Maybe you don't. Maybe you use use your uh, time to good. You you have an iTunes U college lecture all queued up that you can listen to at two minute increments. Is it just me? I'm nervous about pulling my phone out of my pocket at the gas station. We've heard that, I don't know how true this is, but the static sparks can be generated from pulling your phone out of your pocket. You're not supposed to use your cell phone while you're pumping gas. Did you know that? I don't think anybody knows that. I think there's people, I see people who smoke cigarettes. Well, <laughs> that is definitely not supposed to happen. At least, at least uh, with uh, your fondle slab you're not going to blow the gas station up or are you i hope you're not anyway keep it in your pocket of course anytime there's a bunch of people and mostly young people doing that then there's a whole bunch of people mostly people my age going you kids pay smell the air stop and smell the roses look around you see what's going on life is happening and you're missing it i don't know is it are you missing it you're missing the stuff that's immediately around you but at the same time you have a portal a window into a whole different world, just because it's digital doesn't mean it doesn't exist in some form or fashion. I think the stuff that you do and see and play on the internet, I mean, I don't know, is that any more or less a waste of time than looking around and <laughs> seeing what's out the window? I have to say, when I was sitting in that light rail train, I felt like I was wasting my time not using my fondle slab. Probably shouldn't say that in public. Not using my smartphone. <laughs> I feel like looking out the window, well, that's nice. Looking at people, they start to think, why is he looking around at me? What's he What's he doing? Why isn't he looking at his phone? Are you a creep? Why aren't you, why aren't you looking? I did. I felt like a weirdo not looking at my phone when everybody else is. It's like being in the library and everybody's quiet and looking at their books and you're looking around. It just doesn't work. Anyway, I just uh, just a thought. You know, I think we are moving towards a more balanced. I hope we're moving towards a more balanced approach to this, where we recognize that it's not the end all and be all to have the smartphone and stare at it all the time. That there is other stuff going around, but at the same time, not rejecting it. We need balance, right? These things are useful. You've got a supercomputer in your pocket that's always connected to the internet. You can you can you know in the fifteen minutes that you're standing in the line at DMV, you could you can find out what's going on around the world. That's pretty cool. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. What was the post-war world of amateur radio like? Let's take a look at our hobby as it existed in the late 1940s. In November 1945, amateurs were allowed back on the air on the 10-meter, 5-meter, and the new 2-meter band. The 5-meter band from 56 to 60 megacycles was temporary. By March 1946, 
we were moved in the great post-war frequency shuffle to our new 6-meter home from 50 to 54 megacycles. As for the new 2-meter band, it replaced our old 2.5-meter allocation, which ran from 112 through 116 megacycles. Throughout 1946, the military gradually vacated the 80, 75, 40, and 20-meter bands, turning them back over to amateur operations. We lost a few frequencies. The 160-meter band was staying in the hands of the military for Loran radio navigation, and we lost the top 300 kilocycles of 10 meters from 29.7 to 30 megacycles. To compensate us for this loss, the FCC in 1946 gave hams an allocation at 27 megacycles to be shared on a secondary basis with industrial, scientific, and medical devices. Dubbed the 11-meter band, it was unique as the only HF allocation were A0 and A2 emissions were allowed. The amateur population was pushing 60,000 and the FCC was running out of W call signs in the nine call areas. So, the FCC created the 10th call district in 1946 and redrew the district boundaries. The license structure was the same as before the war. Class A hams had all amateur privileges, including exclusive use of the 75 and 20 meter phone bands. Class B had all CW privileges and phone operation on 10 meters and above. Note, at that time, 40 meters was CW only and 15 meters didn't exist yet. Class C had the same frequencies as Class B, but it was a mail order license for those in remote areas. The only change the FCC made to the license structure in the 1940s was to allow applicants to copy the code either by printing or by longhand. Prior to the war, the code test had to be copied in longhand only. Most hams used CW or AM phone, but there were two new modes on the horizon. Narrowband FM enjoyed a brief surge in popularity. QST had several articles on VHF and even HF FM operation. Phase modulation, a variation on FM, made its first appearance in 1947. But the big news was something called SSSC, or Single Sideband Suppressed Carrier. SSB, as it would eventually be called, appeared on the ham bands late in 1947. Throughout 1948, QST was full of articles on this new mode. And how do you get your FM or sideband signal to the antenna? Try an item developed during the war, coaxial cable. And with coax came a new concern over reflected power. Thus, the first SWR meters were described in QST. So, what rig do you want to use on the air? How about war surplus? Starting in late 1946, the pages of QST and CQ were filled with ads for military surplus equipment. Numerous articles showed how to modify these rigs for amateur use. The most popular war surplus receiver was the BC-342, which was built like a battleship and tuned from 1.5 to 18 megacycles. I operated one in my novice days. Maybe you want a new rig. Try the Halicrafters model S40, the Hammerlin HQ129X, which was another receiver I owned, the National NC46, or the Collins 75A. But the Packard of the post-war radios had to be the Halicrafters SX42 receiver. This Radio Man's radio had every possible feature tuned from 540 kilocycles to 110 megacycles and cost $250 in 1946. That's about $1,700 today. Perhaps you would like to build your own rig. GE, Sylvania, and RCA had pages of ads showing off the new miniature and sub-miniature tubes. The sub-minis were only one and a half inches tall and three-eighths of an inch wide. For those who think the 2-meter HT was an invention of the 1970s, it may surprise you to learn that they existed in 1947 using those tiny tubes. But be careful when you get on the air. A new term is finding its way into the amateur world. TVI.
1947, the FCC eliminated TV Channel 1 to reduce 6-meter interference, but amateurs had to learn to shield their equipment. With the help of good engineering practices, the TVI monster was kept at bay. Sort of. The Atlantic City Conference was held in 1947. Hams gained a 15-meter band, which was eventually allocated to us in 1952. Amateurs proved their worth as two disasters, one natural and one man-made, struck Texas in April 1947. Tornadoes sliced through the state, killing 150. And, in Texas City, an explosion on board a freighter set off a chain reaction that killed 600, wounded 2,000, and destroyed two square miles of the city. Dozens of portable and mobile stations rushed to the scene and provided necessary communications on 75 and 10 meters. Also, on a somber note, Kenneth B. Warner, W1EH, the secretary and general manager of the ARRL since 1919, died in 1948. By the way, do you need a job? Are you bored with your life? Do you crave adventure? Then Helicrafters has a job for you. In the fall of 1947, they are sponsoring a six-month expedition to the Dark Continent, Africa, the Belgian Congo to be exact. They need an experienced Class A amateur to operate the radio equipment. If you feel you are qualified, send them your application by July 1st, 1947. Void were prohibited. Finally, what's an amplifying crystal? You don't know? Well, maybe you know it better by its other name, the transistor. This new device was first described in the October 1948 issue of QST. No one at that time realized the full potential of this little component or knew how it would revolutionize the world of communications. In our next installment, we will take a look at the 1950s, 1958 to be exact. World Radio Sport Team Championship 2022 has been postponed for one year. At WRTC 2022 Association Assembly on April 23rd, the event's organizing committee decided to put off WRTC 2022 until 2023 after consulting with the World Radio Sport Team Championship Sanctioning Committee. The WRTC, which was to have been held in July 2022 in Bologna, Italy, has been postponed until 2023. In making the announcement, Carlo, IK1, HJS, organizing committee president, said the difficult decision was made after considering various nations' responses to the public health challenges brought by the pandemic. Carlo said, recent communications from competitors have highlighted various challenges being faced in other nations. There have been no changes in the qualification process or to the overall structure of the event and its sponsoring committee. Although more details will be released later by the committee, Carlo underscored that the postponement will ensure a fair, qualification process for all the event's international competitors while retaining the same overall structure. The last WRTC competition was held in Wittenberg, Germany in 2018, where Ed Durant, DD5LP, was a proud member of the publicity team. We wish the WRTC 2023 Organizing Committee all the best for the next Olympics of Amateur Radio. Further announcements will be forthcoming as new arrangements for the event have been made. The IEEE Committee on Man and Radiation has issued an invitation to its webinar, RF Exposure in the Time of Conspiracies. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more in this report from the ARRL headquarters in Newington. The one-hour event is set to get underway at 1800 UTC on Wednesday, May 12th. COMAR is a group of experts on health and safety issues related to electromagnetic fields from power line through microwave frequency ranges. Its primary focus is on biological effects of non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation. Comar Chair Rick Tell, K5UJU, explains the purpose of the webinar this way. The real idea is to highlight some of the news articles, comments, and so forth that purport to declare the hazardous nature of exposure to weak RF fields, such as those posed by new 5G wireless communications base stations, explain how they are not scientifically based, and possibly some ideas on how to better communicate what we really know about potential health effects. 
presenters are professional engineer Matt Butcher, KC3WD, and Gerald Bushberg, a clinical professor of radiology and radiation oncology at the University of California Davis School of Medicine. He's an expert on the biological effects, safety, and interactions of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Both men are COMART members. Butcher and Tell are also members of the ARRL RF Safety Committee. ARRL RF Safety Committee Chair Greg Lappin and 9GL said the committee devotes a lot of time to examining the science to help keep people safe, but he added, there remains considerable fear in our society about that exposure. It would be to our benefit to understand what people are thinking. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Tell went on to say that WebEx, the platform on which the webinar will be held, imposes a limit of 1,000 simultaneous connections. Those interested may check in at 1730 UTC, a half hour before the webinar is scheduled to start. AWRL lab manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, said radio amateurs are often asked by neighbors about their stations, either out of curiosity or concern that the antennas may pose a safety hazard. The webinar will help amateurs and the public understand why radio energy at exposure levels found in standards and regulations is safe, Hare said. I look forward to watching this to learn more about the best ways that we can answer those questions. Topics on the Comar webinar agenda include what is RF and what are the applicable exposure standards, as well as discussing how to address concerns on the part of the general public and how to improve communication. Comar is a technical committee of the IEEE Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society. The webinar is free. Time now for the AMSAT report. We're hearing more often about satellites coming alive after periods of sleep. This week, we learned that PSAT-2, also known as NO-104, has once again started working after eight months of quiet. Bob Berninga, WB4APR, says the CubeSats developers have no idea why. The telemetry looks fine. Okay, here's the real news. NO-104 will not be in APRS mode, but in a brand new experimental mode that offers DTMF uplink and voice downlink. DTMF tones are also known as touch tone signals. DTMF stands for dual tone multi-frequency. To work the satellite, load your grid and call sign into a 16-digit DTMF memory in your radio. When the satellite hears it, it will assign a QSO number and QSL the grid by voice and then generate an APRS packet for collection by APRS operators. To QSL, you key in the station's two-digit QSL QSL number and then dump your preloaded QSL DTMF message. Successful DTMF grids and messages will appear on a special URL on the PSAT page aprs.org forward slash PSAT2 dot HTML. You'll also find a manual on how to use this new mode at that website. The up and down link frequency is 145.980 megahertz. Just another way to use this CubeSat and a most interesting one. Give it a try and see how you like it. The MSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Time now for this week's propagation forecast. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that our sun seems to have fallen back into a very quiet phase, far different from the way it looked back in November of 2020. That was six months ago, and we assumed that since we were emerging from a solar minimum, by now we would be seeing much more solar activity. Well, it hasn't happened. More recently, sunspots disappeared after May 1st, and solar flux naturally declined as well. Sunspots were visible only the first three days of the April 29th to May 5th reporting week, so the average daily sunspot number declined from 47.6 last week to 11.9 in the current period. But early on the morning of May 7th, a new sunspot group, number 2822, emerged over the sun's northeastern horizon. You can see it as that white splotchy mess crossing the upper left in a stereo satellite image on the internet. Over the past week, the average daily solar flux slipped by 7 points from 79.2 to 72.2.
It seems odd, but both the average daily planetary and middle latitude A indices remain the same for both weeks, 10.7 and 9.9 .9 respectively. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux for the next couple of weeks appears listless, never even reaching 80 with values of 71 on May 7th, 72 on May 8th and the 9th, 74 on May 10th and 11th, 75 on May 12th and 13th, 77 on the 14th of May, 79 on May 15th through the 17th, and 77 on May 18th through the 21st. Looking ahead at the planetary A index projection, it shows 5 on May 7th and 8th, 8 on May 9th and 10th, 5 on May 11th through the 13th, 15 on May 14th through the 16th, 12 on May 17th, 5 on May 18th through the 19th, and 15 and 10 respectively on May 20th and 21st. The Russian Robinson Club has resumed its plans to activate rare Kiska Island, IOTA NA070, and Adak Island, IOTA NA039 in Alaska's Aleutian Islands chain in July for Islands on the Air enthusiasts. Plans to activate these islands in 2020 were called off because of COVID-19 concerns. The uninhabited Kiska Island, 52.06 degrees north, 177.57 degrees east, lies in the North Pacific's treacherous Bering Sea, which the Russian Robinson Club calls one of the most intense patches of ocean on the Earth and where strong winds, freezing temperatures, and icy water are the norm. The island also features the prominent conical Kiska Volcano. Kiska Island is a National Historic Landmark and part of the Aleutian Islands World War II National Monument and the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. Permission to visit is required from both Alaska's Maritime National Wildlife Refuge and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The KL7RRC team plans to have a minimum of two stations on the air on 40 through 6 meters, SSB, CW, and FT8. Operators will place special emphasis on the difficult transpolar path to Europe. The 56-foot aluminum sailing vessel SEAL will make the 1,000-mile journey along the Aleutians to Kiska with a stop at Dutch Harbor to pick up Tim NL-8F, and the gear sent in advance to his location. The team will continue sailing west to Adak Island, where some team members will activate Adak Island on June 30th through July 3rd. The SV SEAL will pick up the entire crew there, which will have flown in by July 3rd. Then they hope to arrive at Kiska and be on the air as KL-7RRC on July 7th through the 12th, before the return sail to Adak and flights home. Additional KL-7 RRC activity may take place from Adak July 14th through the 16th. Donations are welcome. QSLs for KL-7 RRC Kiska Island NA-070 and KL-7 RRC Adak Island NA-039 are via N7RO. All donors will receive direct QSLs. A slot is open for a fifth operator. Contact Team Yuri, N3QQ, if interested. Updates will be posted on the Russian Robinson Club website. Ham Census is inviting all radio amateurs to take part in a unique survey. The project's organizers are hoping to hear from hams in the U.S., Canada, and around the world. Survey questions deal with operating preferences, gear, your shack, views on regulations, clubs and associations, and the future of amateur radio. Email Jim Alyanak, K3MRI, the co-co-administrator of the ham census and ham community, says the aim of the census is to give the operators a louder voice to better inform club leaders, associations, manufacturers, and regulators. We all want the amateur radio community to grow organically and collaboratively, and for that we need to know what operators are thinking, he said. Divided into six parts, the ham census runs year-round, delivering constant updates. Taking and using the survey is free, but only those completing all six sections get access to the complete results. Foundations of Amateur Radio In my day job, I work in computing. For many years, that consisted of going on-site and fixing stuff. 
Invariably, this involved me fixing servers that were installed into a room the size of a room closet, with an optional air conditioner screaming in my ear. The experience often included sitting on a crate, or the floor, holding a keyboard, and if it was a Windows server, rolling a mouse on my knee in order to click on stuff barely discernible on a tiny screen that likely sat a metre too high above my eyeline, with Ethernet wires going diagonally from one end of the room to the other. These days, with ubiquitous internet connectivity, that kind of experience is mostly a thing of the past. That said, operating a radio during a contest in many stations I've used over the years is not far from that kind of layout. Often a traditional shack starts off with a radio on a table, with a notepad to record contacts. Over time that gets expanded with technology, like a computer. It's common to have to juggle the radio display and keyboard to find a spot for the mouse that doesn't interfere with the desk microphone, or to have to reach over to change band and to activate a different filter. Select another antenna, use the rotator or some other essential tool that's required for making that elusive contact. Some stations have multiple monitors, sometimes they're even together, but more often than not they're a different size, sitting too high and the radio sits as a roadblock between your eye line between the screen and the keyboard. I'm raising this because over the years I've not actually seen anyone spend any energy on discussing how you might improve this experience. If this was your workplace, the Occupational Health and Safety Police would be all over you, and for good reason. You could argue that amateur radio is a hobby and that oh &S is of lesser concern. But to that, I'd like to point out that you have the same risk of self-injury at work as you do in your shack, especially if you're doing a contest for 24 or 48 hours. Not only is there a risk of injury, why make the experience harder than it needs to be? Ergonomics is the process of designing or arranging a workplace to fit the user. It's a deliberate process. You have to actually stop to consider how you are using a space, in this case, your shack. At the moment, I'm experimenting with different aspects of the layout of my shack. For example, I started with a layout of the computer, counterintuitive perhaps since we're talking about a radio shack, but given that I'm spending much of my time doing contests and digital modes, the computer is used much more than the radio is, even if the radio is what's making all the on-air noise. After making sure that my keyboard, mouse and screen were in locations that actually helped me, I started trying to figure out where to put the radio, and what role it actually plays in making the contact. If during a contest you're using search and pounce, which is when you hunt up and down the bands looking for a contact, you might argue that you'll need access to the radio to change frequency. But if you already have your computer connected to the radio, you can change frequency from the keyboard, or by control with your mouse. Another way I'm looking on reducing the amount of stress to my body whilst operating my station is by sorting out audio. Almost every radio has a speaker on it, but if you've got more than one going at the same time, it becomes really difficult to determine which one is actually making noise, and even harder if multiple stations are on different frequencies on different radios at the same time. You could wear headphones and select a radio one at a time, either by plugging in a particular radio or by using a selector. If you're using digital modes, the audio might already be going into the computer, which offers you the ability to select from different sound cards, but there are other options. I'm working on plugging the audio from each radio into an audio mixer that will allow me to set the level for each radio independently. Mute at will, set the tone, the balance between left and right ear, and a few other things. For a microphone I plan on using the same mixer, and I'm working on how to have my digital audio coming from the computer incorporated into the same audio environment, because the digital audio could just as easily be a voice caller using the same system. For push to talk I settled on a foot switch a couple of years ago. That said, if I'm on my own, I tend to use Vox, or voice operated switching, which turns on the transmitter when microphone audio is detected by the radio. This will need some careful planning if I'm going to connect multiple radios, since I don't want to transmit the same message across each radio at the same time, but with computer control that too can be addressed.
My point is that we have lots of technology available to us as radio amateurs to achieve whatever we need to. It takes extra effort to decide how you might go about making your environment a place where you can safely sit and operate without making life harder than it needs to be. What kinds of different techniques and technologies have you used to make your shack a more comfortable environment? Do you spend your days hunting DX, doing contests, or making digital contacts, or something else? Have you considered how you might improve the layout of your shack to suit your particular use case? And when was the last time you checked to see if the decisions you originally made are still valid today? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Arizona Congresswoman Debbie Lesko has reintroduced a resolution with bipartisan support to designate April 18, 2022 as National Amateur Radio Operators Day. Introduced on April 19th, the measure recognizes the important contributions amateur radio operators have made. She introduced a similar bill in the last Congress. Throughout history, amateur radio operators have provided invaluable services to our communities, Lesko said in a news release. I am proud to reintroduce this resolution to honor the important contributions amateur radio operators have made in Arizona and across our nation. Amateur radio has brought people together and has provided critical emergency communications during natural disasters. Amateur radio is a vital part of our nation's communications infrastructure. Lesko said she was initially approached to introduce the resolution during the last Congress by then 12-year-old Raymond Anderson, N7KCB, of Peoria, Arizona. As Lesko's resolution notes, the International Amateur Radio Union designates each April 18th as World Amateur Radio Day to recognize the founding of the IARU in 1925. She said her resolution would recognize the amateur radio community with a national day in the U.S. The resolution cites the Amateur Radio Emergency Service for providing invaluable emergency communication services following recent natural disasters, including but not limited to helping coordinate disaster relief efforts following Hurricanes Katrina, Wilma and Maria, and other extreme weather disasters. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, praised the initiative. The voluntary contributions of America's approximately 774,000 amateur radio operators in support of the critical communications infrastructure of the United States are rarely recognized, Roderick said. Congresswoman Lesko's resolution is an important first step in correcting that oversight. On behalf of ARRL's members and all amateur radio operators, I commend Congresswoman Lesko for her support of amateur radio and her leadership in bringing deserved recognition of the 106 plus years of amateur radio's substantial influence on the development of modern communications. Lesko was joined by members of both parties as original co-sponsors of the resolution. The list includes Representatives Robert Adderholt of Alabama, Julia Brownlee of California, Kat Kamak of Florida, Paul Gosar of Arizona, Glenn Groffman of Wisconsin, Vicki Hartzler of Missouri, Ashley Hinson of Iowa, Chris Jacobs of New York, Kaiyali Kahele of Hawaii, Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania, Doug LaMalfa of California, and Daniel Webster of Florida. The pandemic modified AWRL field day rules for 2020 will continue this June with the addition of a power limit imposed on Class D home stations and Class E home stations running emergency power. With more details to refresh your memory of the pandemic modified field day rules for 2021, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. The news from the ARRL Board's Programs and Services Committee comes as many clubs and groups are starting preparations for Field Day in earnest. Field Day 2021 will take place June 26 and 27. For Field Day 2021, Class D stations may work all other Field Day stations, including other Class D stations for points. This year, however, Class D and Class E stations will be limited to 150 watts PEP output. For Field Day 2021, an aggregate club score will be published just as it was done last year. 
The aggregate score will be a sum of all individual entries that attributed their scores to that of a specific club. ARRL Field Day is one of the biggest events on the amateur radio calendar. Last summer, a record 10,213 entries were received. The ARRL Field Day webpage, www.arrl.org forward slash field hyphen day, contains complete rules and entry forms as well as any updated information as it becomes available. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. This early decision should alleviate any hesitancy that radio clubs and individual field day participants may have with their planning for the event, said ARRL contest program manager Paul Baroque, N1SFE. With the greater flexibility afforded by the rules waivers, individuals and groups will still be able to participate in field day while still staying within any public health recommendations and or requirements, Baroque said. The preferred method of submitting entries after field day is via the web applet. The ARRL field day rules include instructions on how to submit entries, which must be submitted or postmarked by Tuesday, July 27, 2021. Once again, ARRL field day webpage contains complete rules and entry forms, as well as any updated information as it becomes available. You can join the ARRL field day Facebook page also for more information. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, a members-only benefit. Visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar webpage to register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions. HF Noise Mitigation, hosted by ARRL Northwestern Division Director Mike Ritz, W7VO, is scheduled for Thursday, May 6th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 1930 UTC. An educational seminar to help both new and experienced HF operators who find themselves plagued with noise. We'll learn what noise is, discuss the various noise sources, and talk about how to mitigate those noises using a variety of techniques. W1AW Antenna Farm, hosted by W1AW Station Manager Joe Garcia and J1Q, is scheduled for Tuesday, May 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern, 1700. UTC. Experience a bird's eye view and description of the antennas used by W1AW for the station's scheduled transmissions and visiting operator activity. All the antennas used at W1AW are single band Yagis. Viewers will also see the 5 GHz sector antennas that are part of W1AW's Arden system. Ask the Lab how ARRL's technical information service can help you. Hosted by ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare. W1RFI is launching on Tuesday, June 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Learn all about the ARRL Technical Information Service and the expert ARRL laboratory staff who answer thousands of questions each year from members. Get tips about projects, suggestions to address various station installations, and help for some of your most pressing ham radio questions. You'll discover how to search ARRL's extensive periodicals archive, find helpful articles, read test reports, access technical forums, and find answers to technical questions. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is always subject to change, so check the League website for more information. A recent Earth Day event in California became a showcase for the public safety role radio can play, and one group of hams made the most of it. As residents in Pollock Pines, California, celebrated the spirit of Earth Day at a four-hour community event, the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club joined in to celebrate the spirit of communications. The club showcased its neighborhood radio watch program, which gives non-hams an important public safety role in emergencies through their use of affordable general mobile radio service handhelds, as well as pagers and scanners. According to the club's public information officer, Alan Thompson, W6WN, this technology is especially important in a region so prone to deadly wildfires. He said the club started three such programs in Northern California last year, and is preparing to launch three more before wildfire season takes hold this year. 
Allen said residents clearly got the club's message during the Earth Day event, and a few former radio amateurs stopped by, expressing interest in becoming active in radio again and joining the club. Allen said everyone benefits from partnering with non-hams in Neighborhood Watch. He said these neighborhood radio watch programs have had the unexpected benefit of generating tremendous local goodwill and PR for our club, expanded our membership, and dramatically increased donations. Community radio programs like these could be key in helping ensure the future of many clubs and even amateur radio itself. The Register website has published a radio-related story in its Geek's Guide to Britain series. Guillermo Marconi is famous for sending the first transatlantic wireless signal from Cornwall to Newfoundland with his two radio stations on the Lizard Peninsula, but he worked up to this achievement on the Isle of Wight, which the Register describes as England in miniature, lying just off the south coast of Hampshire. Marconi's Needles wireless telegraph station existed for just two and a half years, but its location on Allen Bay at the west end of the Isle of Wight is marked by a stone monument. Plaques on each of its four sides tells the story of how, between December 1897 and May 1900, the Italian technical entrepreneur and his staff carried out pioneering experiments in wireless communication. They exchanged radio messages with Bournemouth and Poole, 22 and 29 kilometres away respectively, and then with ships 64 kilometres away. On the 3rd of June 1898, Lord Kelvin helped to monetize the technology by sending the first paid-for radio telegram over the system. And on the 15th of November 1899, the contents of the Transatlantic Times, the first newspaper produced at sea, were sent from the Isle of Wight station to the American liner St. Paul. The station itself was actually a sitting room at the Royal Needles Hotel, with a hole drilled through its window connecting the equipment to a 168-foot mast outside. The hotel, window and mast have gone, replaced by the Needles' landmark attraction, a selection of rides, sideshows and shops next to an enormous car park. Marconi's monument is tucked into a corner of the site, surrounded by a semicircular stone bench and a platform looking out across the Solent towards Bournemouth and Poole. You can read more at www.theregister.com. Auto registration in the FCC Commission Registration System Amateur Radio Exam for candidates using a Social Security number will be discontinued on May 20th of 2021. Applicants must use an FCC registration number for all licensed seat transactions with the FCC. Examiners must register in CORES, C-O-R-E-S, and receive an FRN before exam day. Starting on May 20th, electronic batch file applications that do not include a candidate's FRN will be rejected. The Social Security Licensee ID field will be disabled. An instructional video provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to establish a CORES account, which is necessary for licensees. After June 29th, all filers must provide an email address on all applications. When an email is provided, applicants will receive an official electronic copy of their license once granted, allowing incoming mail from authorizations at FCC.gov. If no email is provided when filing on or after June 29, the applications will be rejected. ARRLVEC suggests that those without access to mail use the email address of a family member or a friend. Licensees need to log into the Universal Licensing System to download their authorizations. The FCC no longer issues paper copies. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. So what tools should I bring is a question I often find myself asking. Unlike changing the oil in the car, I can't always bring all the tools I want to when working on a tower. Lots of folks use a hanging tool bag. I don't use one, so I don't get to carry all my tools. I have to anticipate what I may need to bring along. The job sort of dictates what tools I'll need. I often wear a light windbreaker with two large zipper pockets on the front, and that's where most of my tools and supplies ride during the climb. The basics I usually carry on first-time installations are pliers, vice grips, wrenches in standard sizes, one locking razor blade knife, two small variable wrenches, one multi-purpose belt-mounted hand tool that includes screwdrivers, cutters, and a knife. I also bring several rolls of coax seal and electrical tape. 
some extra stuff I always bring are a AA battery powered HT and an earbud speaker. I bring two loop type canvas climbing straps, extra carabiners, a camera with film and battery. I photograph my work for the customers, many of them seem to really like that. When working on an installation I'm not very familiar with, I use extra straps and safety gear just in case. If the tower you're climbing on has a steel safety cable, but your ascender is made for ropes, the ascender will slip down or not lock with downward pressure. Always be sure to bring extra carabiners if for nothing more than to secure each ascender where you climb to so they don't slowly, silently sneak downwards. There are two basic types of applications for ascenders. For climbing with a steel safety cable, the regular rope type ascender won't latch properly. Climbing with a steel safety cable ascender on a rope, the rope could get damaged by the tough clamping action of the steel cable type ascender. Always be sure you are using the proper type of ascender before climbing. An ascender is a device which is slipped over a rope or cable and is connected to a climbing belt. As the climber goes higher, the ascender slides up the cable but if pulled downwards, it grips tightly and holds in place. Many commercial towers have safety cables. Before you use a safety cable, check it and be sure it's in good condition. When climbing down on the same ascender, you must grab its handle and lift upwards to release the catch and then push the ascender down as far as you can reach, then climb down to it. An additional safety device you could use would be a carabiner from your harness to the safety cable in case you unknowingly became unattached from the ascender. I hear from lots of people about a fear of climbing. I always tell them the same thing. After you get above the treetops, you lose the sense of gaining altitude. Just like riding in a commercial airliner, if the plane gained or lost altitude, maybe a couple thousand feet, you would have no way to tell just by looking at the ground. The same thing is true for tower climbing. The change in the way things look is so gradual, it's hard to tell you're getting higher from the air. I'm always too busy paying attention to what I'm doing and how I feel. I seldom pay attention to the scenery until I get to where I need to go. It's difficult to look straight down since the tower blocks most of your view. It's easy not to ever see the ground directly below you. I think a healthy respect for heights can help keep you from taking unnecessary chances with safety gear too. So don't let a little fear stop you from taking care of your own tower work. What you should be afraid of is climbing without the proper safety gear and training. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Ham Radio Prep, the nation's fastest growing amateur radio education program, has submitted 25 suggested questions to the National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators for use on the upcoming revision of the Amateur Radio Technician Class Examination Pool set to go into effect next year. The NCVEC revises question pools used in the examinations for the three amateur radio license classes every four years, and the new question and answer pool for the technician license is scheduled to take effect on July 1, 2022. NCVEC issued a call for suggested questions for the question pool with a submission deadline of June 30, 2021. Ham Radio Prep has tens of thousands of students who have used its courses for the technician, general, and amateur extra classes of licenses. Because of that, the organization feels uniquely qualified to offer insight and input on the new question pool for the technician exam. The new questions were generated in a variety of ways, according to Chuck Giese, general manager of Ham Radio Prep. In submitting these questions, Ham Radio Prep drew upon the expertise of its own staff as well as its many students to draw together questions we feel are important to be included on the next round of technician class exams, Giese said. Our students often have comments about the questions they encounter on their exams, and we have used that input in an effort to bring their experience to the NCVEC Question Pool Committee. Questions submitted to the NCVEC included correct answers and distractors on a variety of subjects ranging from amateur radio operations, technology, emissions, Federal Communications Commission rules and regulations, frequency use, and more. There are more than 750,000 licensed 
amateur radio operators in the United States and its territories. Ham Radio Prep offers courses designed to teach people online the information they need to take exams that grant them Federal Communications Commission licenses for amateur radio. The courses also teach students how to be legal and safe on the airwaves in accordance with FCC rules and regulations. Ham Radio Prep was established in 2017 to assist people interested in obtaining an FCC-issued amateur radio license by offering courses for the FCC technician, general, and extra class licenses. Bouvet is like Mount Everest of DXCC entities. 3YOJ at expedition co-leader Paul Ewing, N6PSE said. It's among the most challenging entities to activate due to the significant transportation cost and personal sacrifice required by the team to make the 42-day round trip. Fortunately, Bouvet is not our first mountain. Ewing reports that Mike Crownover, AB5EB, a veteran emergency room physician, has joined the 3YOJ de-expedition team to pair with an ER doctor, Bill Straw, KO7SS, bringing the team total to 15. The de-expedition is set for January through February 2023, but the planning stage is to activate the second most wanted DXCC entity is well underway, with the team researching polar quality tents and equipment and discussing antenna specifications with various manufacturers. We'll make careful choices to help us meet the demand for the Bouvet contact, Ewing said. The 3YOJ team has set a goal of making at least 100,000 contacts from Bouvet. Follow the de-expedition plans for the de-expedition website and the Facebook page. 82 years after the submarine USS Squala sank during a test drive in the Gulf of Maine, a group of amateur radio operators is devoting the anniversary date to remembering the tragedy. Although 33 survived the accident on May 23, 1939, 26 perished in the accident. Members of the Maine Ham Radio Society will be calling QRZ as Special Event Station W1S and a certificate will be awarded to hams making successful contacts with them. According to the Naval History and Heritage Command website, the sinking was attributed to a mechanical failure within the engine that caused the state-of-the-art submarine to begin taking on water. It took until the 13th of September of that same year for the Squalus to be raised. It was brought to the Portsmouth Navy Yard and decommissioned that November. In May of the following year, it was recommissioned as the USS Sailfish. If you enjoy sending or simply receiving in the digital modes, there's a radio show you might want to tune into. You've probably heard the sound of MFSK32 in the ham bands, but if you hear it in the shortwave broadcast bands, chances are you're hearing shortwave radiogram. It's a radio show that transmits text and images using digital modes familiar to radio amateurs, but the digital sounds are broadcast in AM. The weekly half-hour show airs on shortwave stations WRMI in Florida and WINB in Pennsylvania. Shortwave Radiogram just celebrated its 200th episode with broadcasts April 15th through the 18th. The project began in 2012 on The Voice of America as VOA Radiogram. Producer Kim Andrew Elliott, KD9XB, explained why he created this unique program. With more and more countries finding more and more ways to block the Internet, we can use radio to get uncensored news into denied areas. Digital text modes via old analog shortwave radio transmitters can do this job. The content gets through even in reception conditions where voice content is difficult to understand. When Kim retired from VOA in 2017, he moved the show to WRMI and WINB and changed the name to Shortwave Radiogram. Every week, listeners from all over the U.S. and the world decode the text and images and post them on social media for discussion. Kim posts information and the show schedule online at swradiogram.net. That's S-W-R-A-D-I-O-G-R-A-M dot net. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. 
This, of course, is an all-volunteer position. An amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone. Headset mics are not used. And be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. The year just gone for many was a year to forget. But for Stockport Radio Society, 2020 was a momentous one, with the Society clocking up 100 years of existence. On the 4th of June 1920, a group of local enthusiasts came together and held the inaugural meeting of the then Stockport Wireless Society at the Foresters Hall, close to the town's famous marketplace. With a century on the clock and only a short period of inactivity during World War II, Stockport Radio Society, as it's now known, is still going strong, in good shape and entering its second century. An organisation of such an age will have a rich vein of history running through it, so much so that back in the 1990s the then chairman, Laurie Newman, Gulf War Zulu Delta Oscar, was minded to research and document it. His book, released for the 75th anniversary of the Society, told their story from formation up to the 90s and referenced some of the many personalities who had joined the ranks over the years. So, here we are, some 26 years on, and there's plenty more history under the belt waiting to be told. Rising to the challenge has been the Society's Secretary and Media Manager, Heather Stanley, Mike Six, Hotel November Sierra, who volunteered to take on the daunting task of continuing Laurie's work. Many hours of research followed, which has finally resulted in a book which Laurie would be proud of. The fully illustrated edition, which features input from recent Radio Society of Great Britain president, David Wilson, Mike Zero, Oscar Bravo, Whiskey, includes Laurie's original publication and individual sections continuing the story. The book is titled Stockport Radio Society, celebrating 100 years of amateur radio, and it's available now to order. For more information and to order a copy, please contact Mike Six Hotel November Sierra by email to info at golf 8 sierra romeo sierra dot co dot uk. The special event call sign golf 8 sierra romeo sierra stroke 100 was used by many club members to celebrate the club's 100 year centenary and many contacts were made on all bands and modes including CW. 100 years of operating is a great achievement for Stockport Radio Society. So here's to another 100 years of operating. The youngest hams in IARU Region 1 are taking their online format to a new level by introducing an interactive environment. The Shape of Youth on the Air Online, the virtual gathering spot for young amateurs in IARU Region 1, is changing. It's making the move from live stream to interactive forum. The new format, which goes into effect in July, was outlined in late April by Region 1 Youth Working Group leaders during an online meeting. The April 29th session was, in fact, identified as the last such meeting under the old format, which was streamed live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Claudia Grober, DC2CL, a member of the Public Relations team, said the simple live stream meetings are giving way to interactive sessions with voice and chat capability. She said the experience will be more like a bar camp style, referring to the fluid open environments, often called the unconference. The point of shifting to a new format is, in true ham radio spirit, better communication. And finally this week, if you've been on the fence about what kind of antenna is best for your operations, you might want to have a talk with Hannah Kemp Welch, M7HKW. There are dipoles, Yagis, Delta Loops, and multiband verticals, but Hannah Kemp Welch prefers to connect her radio to a fence. She and a group of like-minded artists demonstrated recently how good fences can make good connections. On Saturday, May 1st, the women went to various locations in the UK and France 
as part of a virtual performance by their year-old group called the Shortwave Collective. The project was called Fenstena. Its goal was to use the receiving properties of their chosen fence to scan the shortwave bands. Whether it was a fence at a former railway station in London or part of a sheepfold fence in France, they obtained respectable reception. As seen and heard in the video posted on YouTube, in one demonstration, they picked up everything from a two-meter beacon to a variety of voices from China, Russia, and Spain. One member of the video audience remarked in the accompanying chat, if someone could pick up the Wednesday game for me, that'd be great. Although it's often said that fences can divide, it's clear these fences succeeded in making a series of new connections and all through the power of radio. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.